Welcome eighth grade again to the Defense Against the Dark Arts classroom where we will not be reading about Harry Potter, but instead we'll be reading about um, or reading from the novel Farewell to Manzanar by Jean Wakasuki Houston and James D. Houston. Uh, we are going to take a look at chapter nine today and I'd like to look at the questions that go along with that first. There are five questions for chapter nine. And we see that here. Um, question one, define the word emasculation. It's fine to look this up in a dictionary and write your answer. Use the definition of this word to help explain why being exiled to Manzanar was more difficult for the men than the women. Um, I am not going to make you look this word up. Instead, what I've done is I have it right here for you because I'm not fully sure at home how many of us are gonna have access to a dictionary. Um, so we can see here emasculation is a noun and uh, it's the noun form of emasculate which is a verb um, we see two definitions one to deprive a man of his male role or identity um, you're basically taking his manhood away um, or we see the second definition make someone or something weaker or less effective so i want you to think about that um, as we are, are looking at Manzanar, particularly Papa, he had held all of these jobs and all of these wonderful things, whether they, he sees them as successes or not, is he allowed to still have those roles when he is at Manzanar? Or is it that this particular camp takes some of that manhood away um, for these Japanese Americans? All right, so let's take a look at question two. The arrest of a young Japanese American cook was the most immediate cause that led to the December riot. But there were many other tensions brewing that also contributed to the climate of anger and frustration. List at least three of the numerous reasons that contributed to these the riots. So in this chapter, we're gonna be reading about some riots that occurred within the camp. Um, and there are many, many reasons why. You need to pick three and explain why those would be causes. Question three, sugar disappears quickly from the internment camp kitchens. Give some symbolic meaning to this fact. So this could be kind of tricky to you. I want you to think about what sugar is. Sugar is sweet something that you, you crave and you want to eat. Um, you might make cookies with it and desserts or you sweeten up a drink, something like that. What is life like right now in Manzanar? Would you call that sweet or the exact opposite? And the fact that the sugar, something sweet keeps disappearing, what could that represent for their lives? Um, that yearning for some, some sweetness. Question four, how many people died in the riot and how many were injured? So two different numbers, make sure I identify the two. And then we have one more question for chapter nine. That is, as Jean peeks out the window, what reminds her that she is in fact living in a prison? All right, so if you would please get your book out, we are gonna read chapter nine, which is also a pretty short chapter for us. And let's take a look at that. It starts on page 72. You are welcome to read along with me, or you can um, turn this off and read it on your own. It is completely up to you which way you choose to do it. It's called The Mess Hall Bells. Papa never said more than three or four sentences about his nine months at Fort Lincoln. Few men who spent time there will talk about it more than that. Not because of the physical hardships he had been through worse times on fishing trips down the coast of Mexico. It was the charge of disloyalty. For a man raised in Japan, there was no greater disgrace. And it was the humiliation. It brought him face to face with his own vulnerability, of his own powerlessness. He had no rights, no home, no control over his own life. This kind of emasculation was suffered in one form or another by all the men interned at Manzanar. Papa's was an extreme case. Some coped with it better than he, some worse. Some retreated, some struck back. 
During that first summer and fall of sandy congestion and wind-blown boredom, the bitterness accumulated. A rage festered in hundreds of tar paper cubicles like ours. Looking back, what they now call the December riots seemed to have been inevitable. It happened exactly a year after the Pearl Harbor attack. Some have called this an anniversary demonstration organized by militantly pro-Japan forces in the camp. It wasn't as simple as that. Everything just came boiling up at once. In the months before the riot, the bells rang often at our mess hall, sending out the calls for public meetings. They rang for higher wages. They rang for better food. They rang for open revolt, for patriotism, for common sense, and for a wholesale return to Japan. Some meetings turned into shouting sessions. Some led to beatings. One group tied, tried to burn down the general store. Assassination threats were commonplace. On the night of December 5th, Fred Tayama, a leader in the Japanese American Citizens League and a friend of the administration, was badly beaten by six men and taken to the camp hospital for treatment. Tayama couldn't identify anyone precisely, but the next day three men were arrested and one of these was sent out of the camp to the county jail at Independence, 10 miles away. This was a young cook well known for his defiance and contempt for the authorities. He had been trying to organize a kitchen workers union and had recently charged the camp's chief steward, a Caucasian, with stealing sugar and meat from the warehouses to sell on the black market. Since sugar and meat were both in short supply, and since it was rumored that infants had died from saccharin mixed into formulas as a sugar substitute, these charges were widely believed. The young cook's arrest became the immediate and popular cause that triggered the riot. I was too young to witness any of it. Papa himself did not take part and he kept all of us with him in the barracks during the day and night it lasted. But I remember the deadly quiet in the camp the morning before it began that heavy atmospheric threat of something about to burst. And I remember hearing the crowds rush past our block that night. Toward the end of it, they were, there were a lynch mob swarming from one side of the camp to the other, from the hospital to the police stations to the barracks of the men they were after, shouting slogans in English and Japanese. Idiots, Papa called them, bakatere. They want to go back to Japan? It is more than going back to Japan, Mama said. It is the sugar. It disappears so fast. What do they think they will find over there? Maybe they would like to be treated like human beings, Mama said. You be quiet. Listen to what I am saying. These idiots won't even get to the front gate of this camp. You watch. Before this is over, somebody is going to be killed. I guarantee it. They might all be killed. The man who emerged as leader of the rioters was Hawaiian-born Joe Kurihara. During the First World War, he had served in the U.S. Army in France and in Germany, and he was so frustrated by his treatment at Manzanar, he was ready to renounce his citizenship and sail to the old country. Kurihara's group set up microphones and speakers near the cook's barracks and began a round of crowd-stirring speeches, demanding his release charging that Tayama and the administration had used his beating to cover up the sugar fraud and saying it was time to get the Inus once and for all. That afternoon, the authorities agreed to bring the young cook back into the camp, but this wasn't enough. By six o'clock PM, 2000 people were looking for blood. The internal security force made up of internees like the demonstrators had evaporated in the face of such a mob. For a while, they had camped to themselves. They split into two groups, one heading for the police station to free the cook, the other heading for the hospital to finish off Tayama, who had been concealed under a hospital bed. A vigilante party, vigilante party searched the corridors. When they failed to find their man, this half of the crowd moved off in search of others on their death list. 
Meanwhile, the mob heading for the police station had been met by a detachment of military police carrying submachine guns and M1s. When an army captain asked them to disperse, they stoned him. Now they were hooting, Banzai! Jeering threats at the MPs and singing songs in Japanese. MP means military police. The MPs started lobbing tear gas bombs and then with no amount announcement or command to shoot, while the mob swirled frantically to escape the gas, several soldiers opened fire. This instantly cleared the street and the riot was over. Only the dead and the injured remained. 10 were treated in the hospital for gunshot wounds. One young man was killed on the spot. Another 19 year old died five days later. So do the math and put those together into your answer. What I recall vividly are the bells that began to toll late that night. After dispersing some of the demonstrators organized shifts and kept them tolling all over camp. With the bells and the MP jeeps patrolling up and down the streets, I was a long time getting to sleep. Against Papa's orders, I kept sneaking looks out the window and I saw something I had only seen once before, the searchlights. They operated every night, but I never saw them because I went to bed so early and our block was well in from the perimeter. From the guard towers, the light scanned steadily, making shadows ebb and flow among the barracks like dark square waves. The next morning, I woke long after sunup. The lights were gone. Shadows were sharp and fixed, but the bells were still ringing. It was the only sound in camp, the only sound in Owens Valley, the mess hall bells, their gongs echoing between the Inyo Range and nearby Sierras their furthest ripples soaking into dry sand. They rang till noon. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear in the background, my bells are ringing in my kitchen right now. Every hour our clock goes off. Um, it's actually three o'clock here, so it's about time for us to wrap up. Um, a couple things that I wanted to mention um, within this though. So what is it at the end that Jean notices that reminds her that she's really in a prison? Some of these things are very reminiscent of the concentration camps as well. We talked about those high towers and the barbed wire fences that were around the camps, which are around these camps as well. What is up in those towers? They have searchlights going all night long, making sure that no one is leaving. Another thing, I saw this on TV recently, um, one of the men who had been in the camp had commented you know, they claimed that they put us there to protect us, but then why were the machine guns pointed in instead of out? So really they, they are in a prison and we see this here too when they, they open up on them. Um, so that is at the end of it. The one question that I feel like we may have struggled with that, um, so we need three reasons, I believe, right? Let's peek at that question here real quick. We need. There it is. So we talked about all of these. Um, we need three of the numerous reasons that contributed to the riots. So we really kind of have to go back and think pretty deeply about it because it's not really clear cut and come pointed out to you here. Um, but the emasculation of the men taking away their their role and authority. They don't necessarily have, have these jobs. Um, the, the, certainly the boy being um, taken away as well. Um, there, it mentioned the bells. Here we go. In the months before the riot, when the bells rang, they're having town hall meetings. They're getting together and they're discussing um, things that are bothering them and how can we come up with solutions and try to make these things better. better. So here's your true long list. All these things that the bells ring for are the, the items that are bothering the people. Higher wages. Remember, we read that in the previous chapter with Mama. She's, that's not a fair wage. They rang for better food. So they're getting military food and slop. Um, they rang for open revolt. Uh, they want to fight back for patriotism, um, for common sense, for wholesale return to Japan. 
Um, so there's a, a list within there. Make sure you can pick out ones that you're able to explain for me as well. Um, the idea of the bells ringing, I don't know how many of you saw this on the, on the news. I have a cousin who lives in Brooklyn and he had shared um, on Facebook how eerie it was to hear the church bells ringing all day long. It was a, a couple of days ago. Um, they rang the bells for all of the people who have died in New York City because of the coronavirus and those bells rang and rang and rang and rang. Um, so, so just another uh, small connection on my part. Uh, the lesson's technically wrapped up. I, uh, I would like you to please make sure that you um, finish up all of the questions for this chapter. I'm not 100% sure off the top of my head which questions are being submitted together, so please make sure that you check the to-do list of what to do each day. Um, I believe this is the first day of a week, um, but I also believe I told you last week that the first one would be submitted with, with this, or the most recent chapter would be submitted with this one. So I hope you have a great rest of your day and I will see you tomorrow. Bye.